Hi everyone, thank you for spending the time to watch this presentation on DataOps. My name is Lars, I run a small company based in Stockholm, Sweden, My name is Kling, and uh, we, run, we build and run customized data pipelines on behalf of our clients, and I will tell you more about that at the very end. We are essentially a company built around DataOps, and I've been doing DataOps for a long time now. Uh, my history in this, on the subject dates back to 2013, where I was part of the data platform team at Spotify, and we decided that we needed to enable more teams to make use of data. There was just a few teams that were capable of using our, our data platform data lake, even though it was quite large at the time. And we wanted to enable every developer team in the company to, to make use of data and to innovate based on data. Uh, so we made a transform on how we work with data, and later we uh, learned that it, it had the name DataOps, but it didn't yet, yet have a name at the time. We didn't never managed to at the time to explain how to the world what we were doing and how we did it, and I tried to do so in 2018, but it, the, the concept was still unheard of, so the conference proposal was re rejected. And uh, back in tw two years ago, in 2019, I held a as far as I know, the first presentation on data ops in Scandinavia and uh, that on the Data Innovation Summit. And that turned out to be the most watched talk among the recordings. And now we are here two days later and we have a whole day dedicated to data ops. So it has really risen in, on people's radars. And why would you want to spend your time on that? Well, uh, one of the proudest moments in my career was when I realized that uh, Discover Weekly was built a year and a half later after our transform. And uh, the, the people that built it uh, held a presentation and they said that uh, we, were in a, we were able to build this thing, just a few people in a few weeks and launch it in a few months because there were so many things that were already available. There were data sets out there that we could reuse. There was the infrastructure uh, and, and uh, people had curated the data sets and so forth. So it was all very simple to innovate. And this was precisely our goal with the data ops transform we made. Now, this level of innovation is not available to most companies, and uh, but that is sort of the ultimate goal, more or less, of, of uh, making or adopting the practices of, of data ops. So a good example of the ultimate goal. So, what is data ops? Uh, data ops is about turning your what used to be a craft into a in, 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 turning that into a factory, and and from a from a manual manual working process with your hands to a uh, pros, a factory, automated factory process. And we see this uh, in lots of places in, in IT. We, we see it in infrastructure where we move from pet servers to, to infrastructure as code as we spin up in the cloud on demand, uh, from waterfall uh, to agile and release processes where we used to build the, the precious release 2.0 and give it to QA who would uh, validate it and so forth. And now we have a continuous, uh, continuous releases and continuous uh, quality assurance processes. Now for data, this means that we have gone from the database-oriented architectures in the past with, with mutable, precious data, mutable data, where we cra carefully crafted code. And if something went wrong, it was all it was all destroyed and we, and we had to spend lots of time recovering from it. Two pipelines and, and data factories where we store the raw data and we do transformations but never touch the raw data so that we think go wrong, we can rebuild the, the data sets and do it all again. So if, if we take the, one of these processes and look at it naively, we, we see that it's a, uh, we take the raw data, we turn it into some, some kind of valuable data. And this is what analysts uh, do all the time with their hands, with their Excel sheets and so forth. Uh, and this only takes us so far to, to do by hand. So in a mature data environment with mature data pipelines, they kind of look something like this, uh, where, where you have the raw data and you not, not only refine it, but you also improve the data a bit by curating, deduplicating, mending broken data, bringing in additional data sets to, for, to, to cover up for the missing pieces and so forth. And you monitor the quality to make sure that the incoming data is of good quality, the outgoing data is of good quality. And if you have complex things like, like if, uh, forecasting to, to cater for late data and so forth, you do several variations and, and measure how they perform and so on and so forth. So this is, in data mature companies, this is a, a typical pipeline, but you have to be efficient in order to get to, to man, be able to manage this level of complexity. 
And this is absolutely crucial to be able to do in order to get sustained return on investment for machine learning. Because uh, lots of people have, have the impression that machine learning goes something like this, that you take the raw data and you build a model and then you throw it out into production and then, and then you're done, you can move on to the next thing. But in reality, valuable machine learning models look just like these complex pipelines and where, where you need to curate things and you need to monitor how they perform and, and monitor that they both in, in going and outgoing data is still okay and so forth. And Eric, there's a quote here from Eric Bernardson who made uh, some of the first recommendation implementations at Spotify. Uh, and and he, he points out that the value is really in this plumbing all around, not so much in, in the models. And, and in many cases, you can, you can just have just the plumbing and not have a model and just have a human instead who is informed by all of the, all of the data and that can very well outperform machine learning in many cases. So how do we learn to do this well? Well, we've created data factories. So we look at the experts on factories and, and uh, Toyota is the who sort of invented the lean process is the obvious shining star here. This is the book that has the, had the most profound effect on, on my career and the way I work. And it was really an enlightening read. All of the principles mentioned in there are uh, directly applicable to, to IT. Uh, I will mention a few of them, but uh, the one that I will concentrate on most here in this presentation is waste, because we have so much waste and therein lies the the uh, a great potential. There are different uh, species of waste out, uh, out there in data processing systems. Uh, there's cognitive, things that we humans need to, to keep track of, uh, technology, delivery, operational product, and so forth, uh, which I will go through in a moment. And what I find is that companies tend to be good one or two of these forms of waste, but can be completely blind to other forms of waste. And in that blindness, there's a potential. Because if you can learn to see new forms of waste and address them, you, you can significantly improve. So let's look at them. Cognitive waste uh, usually comes from entropy. There are too many different things, there are different ways to store, to store time or different ways to name things or, or different definitions of, of orders or users or, or items and so forth. And this makes it complex and slow for us to move along. And one of the common forms of, of uh, cognitive waste is the uh, it's the sprawl of, of code and documentation all over the place, uh, where you have the same code duplicated in multiple repositories, old copies of, of repositories that somebody forked a year ago and that now turns up in your code searches, or no, or documentation with notes from, from three-year-old uh, meetings and so forth, rather than just the actual thing, the stuff that is here now, which would be a lot simpler for you. So how, how does it appear? Well, it grows organically. It grows all the time. As, long, as soon as we do things, the, the you know, entropy uh, increases and, and all of the waste grows. And also, it, it depends on your culture how fast it grows. If you have lots of, give lots of freedom to people and, and uh, have autonomous uh, teams that, that can choose whatever in how they work and the processes they pick and the technology pick and so forth, the, the waste increases. And also, if you reward throwing things out without looking to see, did I, has somebody already done this? Can I reuse something? Then, then you can, in an environment such as that, you will have more waste. So how do we avoid it? Well, we spend the time to reuse things and we make it easy to reuse things. And in order to reuse, we must be able to find the things that we can reuse. We must be able to find the codes, the definitions and so forth, and read them and understand them. And we must also be able to change them, to adapt to our needs and to fix what's wrong. If we have the, the dove into something of, of relevance and understood it, and we see that something's wrong, we need to be able to fix that so that it improves for the next person coming along. But in order to do that, you need to be feel very safe that if I change something in sort of code that I'm not comfortable with, I, I can verify that it works and doesn't break anything. So essential for in order to eliminate cognitive waste is to have QA processes that you can trust on and that are easy to run for anyone. There's a related form of waste, which is code inventor, code that has been written, created, but not yet fully utilized, not yet put into production or not yet tested by all of the tests that can possibly test 
run this uh, or find bugs in this code. And um, there is a uh, the uh, or the American Californian giants are really good at handling cognitive waste and also to, to handle this code inventory. So we have, in Europe have lots to learn from them. Uh, from their culture. Uh, this is a snapshot of the, or a screenshot of, of the website trunk development, trunkbase development.com, which is one of the methods they use to uh, minimize code inventory and, and standardize QS pro processes and, and, and so forth. So uh, the liver waste is the waste in the time the effort it takes from your idea to to crafting that down and to put it into production there there are things that you need to do there, there you need to research and you need to write code and then design and, and write tests and, and, and so forth but then that you do things that are not absolutely necessary to do for example you uh, wait for people you synchronize you you uh, go through some, some some mandatory process and so forth and in general, if you have more than 10% positive engineer and you are very, very good, usually the waste is much, uh, it takes up the, the majority of the time. And I find that once you learn to see waste in these processes, you see it everywhere in the companies you pop into. And you, the, the waste is usually introduced by, by different assumptions. We've always done it this way, and surely security must look at it, or, or we must. This must go through the staging environment first, or, or checklists, and so on and so forth. And in many cases, it turned out that this is not necessary. In, in particular, not in, in data processing. Uh, but the, these checks and balances are still there for fear of, of breaking things. It turns out, however, that there you this fear and having these checks and balances actually don't make systems more more robust and resilient uh, and this is nowadays proved by by scientific research presented in the state of devops report and the accelerate book which i recommend everyone to read uh, it turns out that the companies that move the fastest and have the shortest time to 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 deliver and putting things into production also have the most robust systems because the ability to throw things out quickly and fix things is more important than, than, than prudence. So there's another form of waste which I, I call data inventor, which is data that we have collected, but we have not yet fully processed. So there's still processing yet to be done. And when there's things yet to be done, there are things that can go wrong. Uh, so, and in a traditional environment where you put data in, in databases and then at one time, for example, when the user requests uh, his, his latest orders or whatever, you do the processing, you do, you do the join and you massage the data to, to sort of display it to the user. Now, if there's a problem here, like the user has changed his display name to include an emoji or something that you hadn't thought about, so you, it, it will break your system, then you notice this at runtime or the user notices this at runtime. Whereas if you did the same processing eagerly before offline in a pipeline, you will notice earlier. So uh, by early pushing processing earlier offline, we can eliminate waste and uh, we essentially create the equivalent of what in the Toyota production system is called an and and cord. This is a way to stop the pipeline, uh, to stop the factory line from, from causing problems downstream when you know that you have a problem. I see, having worked with, with big data for, for quite a long time now, I see a lot and lots of technology waste. Uh, many projects drown under heavy technology. Um, it used to be the case that there was so much focus in, in big data about technology and with Hadoop and other things, but there, you don't actually need most of the technology, new technology. You only need very few things. You need some uh, fine storage compute, uh, a relational database, a little bit of version control, visualization, and then something called workflow orchestration, which is an automation for your operational, uh, to eliminate operational waste, which we'll look at later. There are lots of other things that you may, they may be the right thing for you, they uh, may add value, but you, they are not strictly essential and necessary, and they are not, in general, disruptive for what you aim to do. And 
there is much potential in just cutting things out and, and, and removing as much technology as you can possibly get away with. So operational waste is when the things that you have to do in order to keep your, your systems running or in order to, to launch new things in, in the systems and so forth. And uh, those fall, operational waste kind of fall into two categories. One is friction in, in the things that you want to do. And that friction is usually caused by fear. You need to be prudent so, so that you don't break things. And the other thing is when things go wrong, the, the operational things that you have to do in order to recover, to repair from, uh, from the problems. Uh, and the fear of mistakes is uh, caused, caused by, by the cost of incidents, right? Your fear of causing incidents. So if we bring the cost of, of problems way down, really low, the operational waste goes down. How do you do that? Well, we recognize that data processing is an offline thing. It is usually data processing does not immediately affect users or the factories or whatever we have out there. It's, it's computations that we do offline to potentially be used or for insights and so forth. So if we carefully separate the online from the offline, uh, we can move much faster in the offline and not, have, and not have fear because the incidents are much cheaper to recover from. Uh, so in this in this example, if we if we take the orders from from an e-commerce store and and carefully copy them to the offline without disrupting the online, and then we can crunch and do wild and crazy things. And then when we have something like a fraud model, for example, we carefully copy it without disrupting the online, and uh, you see that there are multiple fraud models there because we are very careful so that if we if if the one that we produce is bad for somehow for some reason, we don't overwrite the old one. We keep a few of the old ones around. So we, we carefully hand off to, to online again so as not to disrupt it. And it turns out that online systems, in order to be, to be robust, uh, you need to have lots of nines in each of the components, right? Very high reliability in each of the components for, them, for the whole system to be reliable. Uh, and uh, operating things with many nines is expensive. That's well known. Uh, whereas at the other end, if you do offline, slow processing batch systems, then you have time to recover from, from things and you can retry again and so forth. And that workflow orchestrator that I mentioned earlier, it's very good at automatically retrying things for you. So tying a, a system based on weak components together to form a, a resilient system. And so if you can get by not with so many nines, but with a couple of sevens, then you can have a much cheaper system and do much more complex things and save your operational overhead for uh, data innovation instead. So it's that stream processing is, is somewhere in between. It's uh, much more heavy, operational heavy than, than batch, but less so than online, the traditional microservices, because in stream processing, the data only goes in one direction. So you have some kind of chance to, to like recover by replaying things. Now, I, every once in a while, I meet people and they say their batch systems are, are, so, uh, are so fragile and they break all the time and so on and so forth. They don't have to be. That means you're doing something wrong. You're, you're probably uh, deviating from, from the good principles of, of batch systems. So, and, uh, but I have lots of other presentations that I made previous on, on how to make your batch systems uh, resilient. So look at my other presentations for, for advice in that case. So moving from the technicalities, uh, I also see frequently see product waste uh, where we're building, not building the right thing or, or not building the things in the right way and so forth. And uh, this is often the case either of work not being driven by pull in, in, in uh, Toyota speak, by, by a stakeholder saying, I want this because it will be valuable or uh, that there's too much friction. So, so the stakeholders uh, cannot get what they need. Uh, and um, or that we have a disconnect between the communication so that we're building the wrong thing. Uh, and I have two uh, pieces of advice here. One is the data democratization, like make, really making data and the ability to process available to everyone within the organization. Because if the stakeholders need something, they can build it themselves, and then they will build the right thing. And the other piece of advice is to form teams not aligned with functionality, but aligned with value flow. So there are a few hands-offs along the path to success. 
So uh, leaving waste a bit, one of the principles in the third production system is to have a, a continuous improvement and a learning organization. <clears throat> and some key, uh, key advice here is one is to not think in terms of projects where, with the limited, uh, where you do something for a limited time and then you, it's done, but to think in terms of products that have that uh, data products that are never ending right they're never done they're always improving and improve improve iteratively and so forth and uh, and in order to iterate you need to learn and you can only learn in production uh, so go to production early and do try to minimize the fear of, of, of going into production with your, with your data pipelines and they expect to fail so you cannot have have shame or, or blame or penalties for for people failing and so forth so uh Quality assurance is different for, for data products. And uh, in traditional products that are not sort of data-driven, their quality only depends on the code, right? And, and Apple is an example of, of a company that really excels at making these products. You get this thing in your hand and it's polished, the code of the product is polished to perfection and it's fantastic. And um, whereas data-driven products are uh, their quality is dependent on code, but also on the data. And it turned out that the processes suitable for, for making the Apple style products are not so great for, for making data because you need to learn from the data. It's, it's volatile, it's organic, it changes all the time. And we saw that uh, when Apple Maps was now launched uh, and the quality was absolutely terrible. But you can, how, how, do you how do you test them and do quality assurance? You can only do that in production because that's where the real data is. So you need, that's why you need to get out into production quickly and not spend your time on the way there. So, which leads us to another form of waste, which I see fairly often, which is infrastructure and waste. You don't, since you need to learn in production, you only need a production environment. You don't need the, you know, the dev environments and the test environments and the staging environments and so forth. That doesn't mean that you, whenever you do a change, you immediately do it on, on one of the, high, uh, the highly valued, uh, very important pipelines. You can have so-called dark pipelines that you, where you run a separate copy of, the, of your pipeline in, in parallel with, with sort of new experiments, new features, but you run it in the production environment so that it gets the real production data. And then you compare with the, uh, the output with, with the sort of the baseline. And uh, if it's good enough, you launch it, or maybe you launch a little bit at a time with an A-B test and, and so on and so forth. And that's how we sort of have, you can call them staging pipelines if you want. Mm. This is an example I uh, saw on the wall of, of a company I visited uh, where there's absolutely no space for learning. This is a, a sort of pure waterfall model on how to how to launch a uh, use case in their lake and i don't know if you can read properly but but the uh, the faces include like two go two committees for deciding you know go or no go two phases of data governance and requirements collection and so on and so forth and and this company is or these teams at least are apparently very scared of writing the wrong lines of code, which is complete, completely the other way around, right? You should be scared of everything else because that's the waste. Uh, you should try to get, to get to the code and get something out there as quickly as possible. Once you've gone through this cycle, it takes at least six months, then you're so exhausted that you, there won't be any time for learning. So, so uh, processes like this is, is the, the, you know, the very uh, sore end of the spectrum and, and the processes like the, we saw in the in Discovery Weekly is the, is the end of the spectrum that, where you want to be. So I hope you got some good advice on how to make your data processing lean in order to implement great data ops. If you want, the, if you want to learn more, this is a handful of books. I've spoken about a couple of them. Uh, the one to the left is the best book description of data ops that I found by Harwinder Atwal. And uh, the one to the top is Data Kitchen's blog. Data Kitchen is a company based in Boston, and they have great resources on, on data ops. It's also a company built around data ops. If you want more practicalities uh, around data ops and on how to sort of do it in practice, uh, the, my presentation from Data Innovation Summit two years ago is, is a good starting point. I promise to tell you something about what, what Skilling is doing. So uh, I have spent a number of years as, as a freelancing consultant try to help companies build up data processing capabilities and get more value from the data and so forth. And 
I've helped them build technology, but it doesn't really make any significant difference in, in most cases because change, they need to change the way they work in order to get value from it. And changing how people work is really, really hard and takes a long time. So we're, we have a different model now where we collaborate closely with the customers, but we do the implementation, the building the pipelines, we host them, we run them for the customers so that we implement the right ways of working with data. And uh, customers can work closely with us because we need, we need their collaboration. They, uh, they have the data, they have the domain expertise. So we, so we, we work, in, work in joint teams and they can learn by, uh, by doing with us rather than us go the, the other way around, us going into an organization and trying to fit them. So time will tell whether it's uh, usually successful uh, or not, but this is what we're up to. And I believe that we need to find new ways of collaboration because the current ways of, of collaborating with each other are not working sufficiently well. There's so much unused potential and so much waste out there. Thank you for listening. I hope you have a great conference.